Uh, everyone, my name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. I'm here to my right with Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is uh, our update on COVID-19, and we're here to. Uh, uh, Dr. Henry will be giving a presentation and to answer your questions. Uh, we're honored to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you very much and good afternoon. So today uh, we're going to give an update on where we are with COVID-19 and go through some of the data and talk about the measures that we're going to have uh, coming up uh, in the next few days and weeks. And where we are today it should be no surprise to most people. We're in a reasonably good place. Since I last provided an update in, in March, we have continued to see progress that is in the right direction. Transmission, hospitalizations and deaths are all down since our last report and this is encouraging. Our approach has always been to only have the minimum necessary restrictions to keep our community safe and now we're at a time where we can progress from legally enforceable community requirements to a place of collective being able to manage this together. We are transitioning from having all of our safety levels all of the time to requiring some of them depending on the situation that we were in, depending on our risk in, at each time and on top of the very core protection that we have from vaccination and we can see that uh, close to 60% of children, 5 to 11, over 90% of adults in British Columbia have received at least two doses of vaccine and close to 60% have received their booster dose. This is important. This level of immunity and protection that we have as a population means that we can move ahead with some other steps. Before I get into the data though, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we have lost now over 3,000 people to COVID in the course of this pandemic here in British Columbia. These are our mothers, our fathers, our aunties, our friends, our loved ones. Even though we are in a much better place today, I know that many families are dealing with the loss of their loved one and that they've had to deal with this during the, this global pandemic has been a very challenging, challenging time. And I would like you to know that our thoughts and our prayers are with you as well. As we've seen in the last little while, hospitalizations and deaths in British Columbia continue to decline. Um, we know that the uh, that the uh, the cases in green in this slide um, peaked in early January and have come down steadily. They have leveled off, leveled off at a relatively low level. And I do need to reflect that this is PCR positive cases. Not everybody who's had COVID, as we know, uh, many people now are using rapid tests and are being able to self-diagnose in the community and take the measures they need without ending up having severe illness and ending up in hospital. So we have been following as well our hospitalizations and trends over time again are slowly coming down and have been leveling off a little bit, but we need to look a little bit more in depth of what, uh, who is being hospitalized in our communities across BC. As you know, we moved to, to reporting hospitalization um, as a census. So it's everybody who's in hospital with a positive COVID test. And it continues to be that about half of those people are people who, with, uh, who are in hospital with an incidental test. So it's not because of COVID that they are in hospital. It is still important to uh, acknowledge that um, they need to be treated differently in some ways because um, COVID requires other precautions in hospital. Um, we continue to see, thankfully, a very low death rate. One of the things that we have started very early on is using other surveillance measures to help us understand the impact of this virus on communities. And one of the ones that has been proven to be extremely helpful is the wastewater surveillance that we started in, in, uh, in 2020. And we can see that this reflected very well what we're seeing in uh, communities and it's not dependent on the number of people who are tested. 
we have seen a, a decrease, a steady decrease over the last few months, um, and a leveling off once again, not quite at the low levels that we were seeing prior to the Omicron wave, but close to those. But in the last week to two weeks, we started to see a slight uptick in wastewater surveillance as well. And that reflects, again, the fact that we have opened up, that we are seeing more uh, transmission in the community, even as hospitalizations and severe illness continue to decline. One of the other things that we've been watching very carefully from the beginning is using whole genome sequencing to help us understand what strains of the virus are causing illness in our community. And we can see from this that uh, that darker shade of red is the Omicron BA.2. We have had predominantly the BA1, and then uh, early on we had a, a subset called the BA1.1, and now about 70 percent to 75 percent of our cases are BA.2. That's important because that um, does help us understand why we're seeing a slight uptick in cases, and it's partly because we see from global uh, data that B the BA.2 is more infectious and can spread more easily. It does not seem, to, however, to cause more severe illness, particularly in people who have been immunized, and so that is an important consideration as well. So when we look at who are the people who are more likely to end up in hospital and are there measures that we can take to help mitigate and prevent them from um, having that severe illness, we can see over time that it is our elders and seniors who are more likely to have severe illness and end up in hospital. And we see that continues with people over age 80 through this Omicron wave also being more likely to have more severe disease. And that has leveled off and has a slight uptick in the last week. Also, when we look at this, we can see how um, younger people are less likely to end up in hospital. So if we break this down a little bit further and look at vaccination status. So this helps us understand whether we are seeing breakthrough cases in people who have been immunized and particularly in people who have received their booster dose or two doses of vaccine, whether there is a, a need for an additional dose. And here in BC, we can see that people who have had their booster dose up to age 70 have very strong protection against severe disease. And this reflects again how um, the timing of the booster dose, the fact that most people received it within the last few, few months, and that it gives good, strong protection against severe illness across all age groups. And a reminder for those people people who have had two doses of vaccine, if you have not yet had your booster, it is important. We see it is incredibly important as you get older. And people over age 70, it does give good, strong protection, but we are seeing some waning of that protection in the last few weeks, and particularly in people over age 80 in our communities with that booster dose still have a risk that is higher than every other age group, except for young people who are unvaccinated. So if we look at the cumulative hospitalization rate over this Omicron wave, we can see that it has differentially impacted people over age 70 and particularly people who are over age 80. And that's one of the, the most vulnerable areas that we can make a difference right now. If we look at the age standardized hospitalization, the need for critical care and death rates, Across the board, we see that people who are unvaccinated have a much higher risk of being hospitalized, having severe illness, ending up in critical care, or dying. And that, that booster dose makes a tremendous difference. And what we call this is age standardized. That means comparing a 50-year-old who is unvaccinated versus a 50-year-old who has three doses of vaccine. And that protection that you get from that uh, from two or three doses of vaccine is apparent across all of the critical care markers. The two most important factors that we know, and this uh, bears out again and again, are age and vaccination status. And only one of these we can control. We have no control over our age, but we can control our vaccination status and reduce our risk. And it reduces not only our risk as an individual, but it helps reduce our risk of, of um, being infected and transmitting it to others. And on a population basis, that means we have protection in our community 
from various strains of this variant, um, from Omicron, and from whatever comes next. If we look at uh, our trajectory over the last little while compared to other jurisdictions, we have been able to flatten our hospitalization curve and draw it out, which is really important. That helps preserve our health care system so that everybody who needs it can access it and so we can reduce the pressure on health care workers in the system. And we see that we have a very similar uh, low rate compared to other international jurisdictions. Also see a slight increase um, in the last few weeks, um, not as much as, as apparent in, in other jurisdictions in Canada or, or internationally, but something that we need to pay attention to. I also want to um, present a little bit of the data on the seroprevalence studies. So we've been doing these and reporting on them regularly since March of 2020. And this helps us understand using uh, samples of blood from people at different age groups in our community, how many people have antibodies to the virus and antibodies because of vaccination. So there's one antibody called the nucleocapsid protein, and if we have antibodies to that, that means we've been exposed to the virus and have developed the antibodies to that specific part of the virus. So it means you've been infected with the virus. Not everybody who's infected gets sick with it, but you can develop these antibodies, and it's a marker of recent infection because they tend to fade away over time. The second antibody is one called the S protein, um, and that could be either from being infected with the virus or from vaccination. And what we can see is over this course of the pandemic, particularly in the last month with the Omicron wave that we've had, we now have a very high level of people in our pop population across the board that have antibodies to both the S protein and some to the nucleocapsid protein. That tells us that there's a level of, of protection, not perfect because we don't have a, a marker about how much of the antibody you need, but it does tell us that vaccination and sub subsequent infection in some people means that we have a high level of potential immunity in our community right now that is different from any other phase that we've been through in this pandemic. When we take that into account and we look at the things that are happening right now with increasing activity, with people uh, traveling more, with the slightly more transmissible variant that we're seeing cause infections, we know that we are likely to see a slight increase over time in the next month to two months and then a gradual decreasing again if we continue to do the things that we're doing, in particular to make sure that we're, um, we're keeping up to date with our vaccinations. The other things that we are looking at and the data I've presented says, what can we do to help reduce this potential for increase in hospitalizations? And that's looking at who is most at risk and can we provide them with a booster dose that will prevent that from happening? And I, today we're announcing that in um, that looking at this data, we are going to be offering a spring booster for our elders and seniors in British Columbia as the people being most at risk. We know that the older we are, the more, uh, the sooner that antibodies will wane and the, the less strong our cell mediated, those memory cell responses will be. So an, an extra booster dose right now uh, will provide a rapid increase in antibodies and we've seen that from data in other countries where this has been used and will provide that spring protection as we are able to get to, uh, back to more activities in the community. So it will be available to, uh, we will be providing it to residents of long-term care at any age and assisted living and for community seniors 70 and over across the board in British Columbia as well as for Indigenous people at age 55 and older. And the uh, fourth dose will be at about six months from your first booster dose or the dose three. In addition, we've always had a different program. We've recognized that there are a group of people uh, who are what we call clinically extremely vulnerable. And we know that they needed three doses of vaccine to get the protection that most people have from two. And several months ago, we also uh, put in a booster dose program for that group of people, so a dose four out of about six months. 
And right about now is when many people who are in that CEV group 1 and 2, the immune compromising conditions, will be receiving their dose 4 as well. So this is going to be a really important measure for us to boost the immunity in those most vulnerable to severe illness and hospitalization as we go into these spring months. Along with that, with this level of, of community immunity that we have now, we are in a position where we continue to make progress in some of the measures that are no longer necessary all the time. One of those is the, the BC vaccine card, which was very effective at supporting people to get vaccinated, but also during this highest risk period, um, being able to, to have these measures in place in those highest risk settings. So it is no longer required under order, so no longer a legal order. But we do know that many businesses are looking at their own clientele and their own um, people who uh, go into theatres and movie theatres, and some will continue to require this. As well, businesses will transition from COVID safety plans to communicable disease plans. And these were the plans that, that got us through much of 2021, and we reinstated those COVID specific safety plans early on in the Omicron wave when we still didn't understand exactly what um, the, the conditions were going to be with Omicron. So we're now going back to those safety plans, still being aware in every workplace of the risks and the measures that are important to be in place to reduce the risk to workers in all of those situations. Finally, we'll be removing the uh, post-secondary residence vaccine requirement. Um, we have seen that there are very high rates of immunization in young people, um, particularly young people who are living in residence in post-secondary institutions, and so this was not felt to be required anymore. Just to go back for a minute to the spring boosters, I wanted to reiterate how important it is for all of us to ensure that we are up to date with our vaccines. And that means now getting a booster dose. We are seeing a leveling off in transmission, but that doesn't mean our province is no longer vulnerable to new potential variants that are coming in the future. It's important for us to address the risk we have now, but also to think ahead. We're still in a transition phase and we're still in this pandemic and we still have a lot of uncertainty of what's coming next. People who don't have the protection that vaccine gives are at the highest risk, no matter what your age. And more and more data shows us that the booster dose at all ages decreases transmission, doesn't eliminate it completely, but even um, with Omicron, even with the BA.2, it reduces that risk of infection across the board and provides, as we've noted, very strong protection against hospitalization, ICU, and death. So now is the time to get your booster. If you've had Omicron in the last few months, you can wait up to three months. But we know that the, the booster dose does give you longer and stronger lasting protection, even if you've had uh, Omicron recently. I think it's important to recognize as well that we are transitioning from these broad societal orders where we needed all of these measures all of the time. But it's not all or nothing. We need to learn to live with COVID-19 better to make sure that we continue our good habits that protect us, our family, and our community. I also want to say, and we've been talking about this on and off for the last uh, number of weeks, um, but we will be transitioning from the daily uh, numbers reporting to weekly reporting starting this Thursday, April 7th. What that means is that we will be able to um, automatically link data and have more in-depth and detailed, accurate reporting of numbers um, of the previous week to get people a better sense of what we, uh, what we expect to see and what the risk profile is. We have, as we've seen, especially during Omicron when it was very challenging to keep up with the daily um, manual line lists, uh, we see various swings on a day-to-day -day basis. So we now have an automated process that allows us to do it in a more accurate and timely way. As well, uh, we'll be transitioning to a new way of reporting people who've died from COVID. And it's going to be looking at 30-day all-cause mortality in anybody who has had a COVID-positive test. 
So that means we will be overcounting people early on because we know that it takes uh, uh, several days for the linkage to happen between our lab tests and uh, vital statistics. But then as we get the cause of death data in from vital statistics, that will be updated on a rolling basis. And that gives us a more accurate picture of all cause impacts from COVID-19. I do want to just quickly update about uh, the regulated health professionals order. Um, I do want to also say that uh, the changes in use of the BC vaccine card and this uh, order have no bearing on the requirements that we continue to have for all healthcare professionals in our public healthcare system to be vaccinated. That requirement has been incredibly important in protecting our healthcare system through this wave and is important for helping us make sure we're ready for what comes in the future. But we have been working with the 18 regulated health profession colleges to gather data on vaccine status of every reg registrant. And the deadline for this was March 31st, and the colleges are actively doing that right now. Um, we have good uh, data on most people, but they are continuing to follow up on individuals who may have been uh, on vacation or maternity leave and other things. Our team is now actively compiling this aggregated vaccination data by profession and I will be reporting that out by profession so people will have an understanding of uh, the vaccination levels in different professions in the community and can make their own informed decisions about their own care based on that. We are also working with the colleges and will be over the next few weeks and months to put in place processes based on risk so that people will have informed consent about whether they want to receive a procedure or a, a health care service from a private practitioner who is vaccinated or not. I do want to say as well that we are working very hard to integrate all of our surveillance pieces. And though we, re we report out on a regular basis on a number of things, we are following a number of other surveillance streams, including a population, what we call sentinel surveillance. We've had this in place for many years for influenza, and we're integrating COVID into that so that we can look at all of the re serious respiratory illnesses that we have to deal with and manage uh, in the future. So that includes things like influenza, COVID, RSV, and parainfluenza. We're looking at, uh, we will be and continue to do facility-based facility monitoring of cases and outbreaks. We're expanding our systematic early warning signals through uh, wastewater to areas outside of the Lower Mainland. This has proven to be a really helpful uh, um, objective surveillance measure, so we'll be expanding it across the province and also expanding the number of pathogens that we can look for using this wastewater techniques that we've perfected over the last two years. We'll be continuing to do more frequent targeted serological surveillance. So that's looking for those antibodies in the blood that I've mentioned. Um, doing it in a, a shorter time frame that helps us understand the transmission of the different respiratory viruses uh, over time. And we'll be continuing with our whole genome sequencing as we've seen how helpful it is in helping us understand the different transmission patterns of the different variants that are affecting people in British Columbia. As we progress forward through this phase of our pandemic, a transition phase, we are in a place where we can go from those mandated requirements to managing things with the good, managing our own health, looking at the good habits that help us protect ourselves, our family, and our communities. COVID-19 transmission continues, but at a much lower level and with a much higher level of community protection right now. But we know that that will wane over time. So we need to, to build these habits and these tools in that we have now into our uh, future as well. These good habits include the importance of keeping up to date on our vaccination. And that means right now, a, a spring booster dose for our elders and seniors in long-term care and in the community. But we will be watching and looking at different variants that arise, what might our future be in terms of next 
respiratory season late summer and spring and fall. It may be that we will recommend a booster dose for more people. It may be that we will need another booster dose for those who are most at risk. It means paying attention to how we are feeling and staying home if we're sick, using rapid tests to help us make those decisions about whether it is COVID that's causing our illness or not. It means wearing a mask when we choose or if somebody asks you to, or if you're entering their home or their business. It's about also knowing our own comfort levels and respecting that of others. We need to pay attention to things like ventilation, about um, the things that help us, enable us to do this, like paid sick leave. There is no magic moment to lift restrictions, and there's no amount of delaying that will make it absolutely safe all the time. So it is something that we need to find this balance. And I believe as we're transitioning through this, we have the tools that we know work. We have vaccination. We have the things that we are getting used to being in the habit of doing, like staying away when we're sick, like wearing a mask when it's appropriate. This is our time to, to walk through this transition together. And I want to thank everybody across the province for doing their part for so long. It has been a most challenging time. And we are not through it yet. But your kindness and compassion has made the difference in so many ways. And we need to keep doing this together through this phase and as we get to um, the next phase in the spring and fall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, I wanted to uh, uh, just start by uh, uh, joining uh, Dr. Henry and thanking all the healthcare workers across BC for their extraordinary work during this pandemic. One of the areas where this work has been exceptional has been uh, our vaccination campaigns across BC. And uh, yesterday we passed 10 million appointments booked. 11,506,098 uh, vaccines administered, 4,529,770 first doses, 4,358,529 second doses, 2,677,580 booster doses to date. And as Dr. Henry has noted, uh, that effort not only continues but is significantly expanded today beyond even the recommendations of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. I just want to put in context the significance of this, that it's focused, as you can see, by the evidence before us that there are, um, at present, uh, 595,943 people over 70 who've received their booster or third dose. And uh, those, uh, that group of people, as they approach uh, the interval period, will be eligible for an additional booster dose. That's significant. Uh, in addition uh, to that, there are in the category of clinically vulnerable, described by Dr. Henry, those who received their third dose, not a booster dose, but the completion of their, uh, their course of COVID-19 uh, vaccines last fall. That's about 100,000 people in those categories, those people who have uh, our immunity um, suppressed and have access. And of course, the work that will be going on over the next month in April in long-term care where uh, essentially all long-term care homes received uh, the, uh, the option of getting uh, COVID-19, not the homes, but people in the homes, the option of getting a COVID-19 pandemic vaccine, booster vaccine in the month of October. April is six months from then. And so we will be at all long-term care homes, uh, the vaccine campaign in the month of April. And finally, I'd just like to reiterate a very important point about booster doses. There are over 70, currently 68,221 people over 70 who haven't received their booster dose and who are eligible for that dose. And I would strongly encourage them today to go on the Get Vaccinated website or to call 1-833-838-2323 and book their appointment today at the hundreds of, that, of pharmacies that are currently taking appointments. For example, it is, it is 
more than ever important for this group of people to get that first booster dose. And I encourage all of them to get it. And I encourage the 1,198,000 people in BC who are eligible for their booster doses to do the same. It is important in these times. It is a critical protection. Evidence shows that. I encourage everyone to do that. And I wanted to thank all those involved in community pharmacy for all their continued work on this issue. So I want to give a, uh, an update on rapid tests and, uh, and to let you know about a change in the way we'll be distributing rapid tests in the coming weeks. As of April 1st, BC has received 50,317,800 rapid tests. 40,145,396 tests have been deployed to key strategic areas. As presently noted, just over half a million tests in our inventory are not suitable for deployment or personal use. and are being used at the discretion of medical health officers in the appropriate settings. That leaves a current inventory of 9,626,860 tests suitable for self-administered use. But in context, to date, 4.4 million tests have been distributed to K-12 schools across the province. 2.13 million tests have been distributed to post-secondary institutions. And 9 million tests have been delivered to more than 1,300 pharmacies across BC. Tests for, for British Columbians age 18 and old, uh, 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 plus and older to pick up a kit containing five tests at a participating pharmacy. And as of yesterday, pharmacies have dispensed 4.3 million tests. That's more than 800,000 people have picked up their tests from that source. That's in addition to the tests that have been distributed through the education system and many other places. Our inventories in the province remain sufficient to handle expected demand over the next month. Starting October, April 8th, therefore, people can access rapid tests at pharmacies with no care card required. For more information on accessing test kits, British Columbians can visit bcpharmacy.ca to make sure the pharmacy has test kits. It's important to remember that testing continues to be something we do when we have symptoms. That hasn't changed. Increased test availability means more members of the general public will be able to access tests to use to understand their own symptoms and illness and to take action to limit transmission to their friends, family and work, including those at higher risk. And now here's our weekly surgical renewal update. The week of March 27th, 27th to April 2nd marks the first week since September in which there were no surgical postponements due to COVID-19. Health authorities report that 6,983 surgeries were completed March 6th to March 12th. That's similar to what we saw uh, in advance of the, uh, before the pandemic. It's a significant number of surgeries and it's even more impressive for the fact that it's very close to that number, very close to the number we did in that same week in uh, 2019. Uh, as we noted in May 2020 when we made our surgical renewal commitment and as I reiterated last November, when surgeries are postponed because of COVID, it also means that surgeries aren't booked and that's why taking, care, uh, why taking care of these past few weeks by all of you has been so critical and why getting vaccinated continues to be critical to reducing hospitalizations due to COVID and the number of people with COVID in our ICUs so that we can get, give all those involved in delivering surgeries every opportunity they need to do the work we're counting on them to do. When we know someone who's had their surgery or we know someone who's now received their call to rebook their surgery, each of us can, I think, appreciate how meaningful this achievement is for everyone. Each surgery is life-changing for the patient who receives it. And to, th and to this end, I'll be continuing to meet with all those involved in delivering surgeries and all surgical division organizations as we renew, strengthen and rebuild and move forward with our surgical renewal commitment and continue to fulfill our promises to patients. Uh, since our last briefing, since the lifting of mandates and easing of restrictions, I think each of us, going at our own pace and adapting to these changes, has continued to make a difference by taking care in our actions and considerations to stop the rapid spread of COVID. It is by taking care, by doing what we know works to keep those, us, and those around us safe that we continue to give ourselves the much needed opportunity to safely renew. I think uh, for all of us, I want to say, and I just want to say in conclusion how much I appreciate and continue to appreciate the commitment of British Columbians and the generosity of people in this province. 
We need to continue to keep steps to support one another and to keep ourselves safe. This pandemic, throughout its course, and this virus, which doesn't care about, uh, our, about uh, anything but transmitting, will have As people will know, we are in the basement of the legislature. We're occasionally interrupted by bells, which is, uh, for people who work here, I, I think generally a positive thing. So I'll just say that. But it, we, uh, it also uh, it clearly is a virus that doesn't care, care about bells any more than it cares about sometimes our divisions in society around some of these questions. Here in BC, with 94% of adults vaccinated, with the support we've given one another, we have, I think, demonstrated the best possible response to COVID-19 as a community. And I want to thank British Columbians for doing that. There will be more surprises and challenges in the months to come. I know we are up to that. And we are going to continue to keep you informed about the COVID-19 pandemic as we go forward. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. A reminder to media on the line, please press star one to enter the queue for a chance to ask a question and a follow-up. Our first question today will come from the room. Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, you mentioned some businesses may want to keep the vaccine card based on their clientele. What sort of businesses are those? And what is the recommendation for businesses who put in vaccine requirement for their employees based on your advice? Should they continue to keep that vaccine requirement in place for their workers? Yeah, so two very different issues. The vaccine card was in place, as you know, to um, the requirement was in certain uh, places to uh, ensure that only vaccinated people attended those higher risk indoor settings. So I know I've talked with some business owners who own restaurants, for example, um, community restaurants where they feel that uh, they're going to keep that requirement for a period of time. We know as well that uh, some uh, smaller shops that can get more crowded, they also want to keep requirements for mask wearing or for um, uh, people to uh, to have be vaccinated and we've seen that in theaters in uh, uh, museums and places where it actually wasn't required so each business has to do their own due diligence and has to make sure they have the ability to accommodate people um, who aren't vaccinated whether that's um, doing takeaway or being able to uh, watch things remotely so it is about doing your own due diligence but that is still there for people to use um, depending on their own safety protocols. In terms of vaccine mandates for workplaces, again, um, my recommendations have been focused on the health system and we continue to have that in place in the health system, recognizing how important it is as we're going through again, um, there will be more uncertain times in the future to make sure we all have that protection. And I know a number of different uh, uh, businesses, organizations, including the Public Service Agency, did again their due diligence about the risk and what positions were uh, had risk in their uh, different settings. And again, that is up to each business to make sure that they've done their own due diligence and they have the processes in place that uh, meet the requirements requirements of their own collective agreements and other uh, employee-employer agreements. Around uh, long-term care or visitations, uh, no, no changes announced today on that. When should we expect to see some changes around how many people can come to long-term care? And I'm just hoping for Minister Dix also to provide clarity around the announcement about rapid testing. If it now includes all ages can access rapid tests or is it will still be done through schools and how quickly so just those two things please so in long-term care we have opened up visitation in long-term care so that uh, vaccinated visitors of any number can come um, we do rapid testing particularly when people start to come in and we're looking at what is a rational policy for um, for ongoing rapid testing of visitors particularly regular visitors where we don't uh, necessarily need to have a test every single day and now that we have access people can do them at home um, prior to visitation so that uh, that is ongoing and uh, with respect 
check to, to rapid test. So we have about uh, 50 million with us. About 40 million have been distributed. About 9 million have been distributed to pharmacies. Uh, to pick them up, you have to be 18 and older. So that continues to be the case. Uh, what's changing is right now, uh, you are limited within a period in what you can pick up. You know, it will be still one at a time, but you have to give your medical services card number and that number is tracked. After April the 11th, that won't happen any further. We'll simply distribute them. It saves uh, pharmacy costs, it saves us costs, and it reflects the numbers of rapid tests we have. It should be said that um, and I really encourage people to go in the meantime and get their rapid tests from pharmacies because uh, it's a useful tool for people to have. The ones I picked up a number of weeks ago expire, I think, in January 2024, meaning that I won't need necessarily need to use them right away, but it's good to have them in stock in our household, have them there. And so uh, in terms of schools, we've sort of distributed through the school system a very significant amount. But we hold rapid tests on hand and we'll be able to keep that, um, uh, keep people in the education system uh, with rapid test parents and children and their community. With rapid tests into the future, the federal government has generally indicated they continue to, going to continue to supply them and so we're distributing them um, broadly right now. And, uh, and really everyone in BC, every adult in BC, every uh, school age child in BC, um, has access now to rapid tests. They can simply put the, pick them up for free. And that's a pretty as broad an access as we can get. We encourage people to pick them up. And, uh, and uh, there are rapid tests available today at your pharmacies. And there are vaccinations available to be booked and I encourage people to get booked for their vaccinations. Our next question comes from Zhao Zhu, Globe and Mail. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, Quebec and PEI have put a pause on lifting their mask mandates. Was removing mask requirements done uh, prematurely in BC? And uh, what metric would BC need to meet before you re-implement masks? Yeah, so uh, we have um, always thought a lot about risks and benefits when you have a legal mandate in place. And so we removed that, as you know, uh, a number of weeks ago. Uh, given what we were seeing in terms of the high level of, of vaccination and the low levels of transmission. It's now, it's not an all or nothing um, proposition, however. And we still encourage people to wear masks, particularly in those indoor spaces when you're close to people that you don't know, uh, where you might be uh, have poor ventilation or crowding. So we still strongly encourage that for people to choose to do that. But we no longer feel it's necessary to have a legal order that requires you to wear it all the time, every day in those settings. And particularly, we know it impacted uh, children and staff in schools and post-secondary institutions. Um, and people who are also uh, affected by many other measures. So we are um, perfectly, yeah, we believe that we had the right time uh, for removing the mask mandate. We've seen a continued decrease in, in transmission and that people are being respectful of uh, requirements and requests to wear masks. Zhao, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yes, I do, thanks. Uh, the uptake of third doses was slow. How do we expect the uptake of fourth uh, shot to go? And uh, if the uh, vaccine passport was uh, useful in propelling our second doses, uh, why get rid of it? Wouldn't it do the same for uh, third shots? Yeah, it is one measure, but it is only one measure that can uh, incentivize people to be immunized. And that was one of the, uh, the ways we use the BC vaccine card. Uh, and it was quite effective in that. Um, on the other hand, it, there are uh, downsides to the BC vaccine card. So we are, um, oh, there, and I've just, sorry, I lost your, the first part of your question. Zhao, would you mind repeating? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, the uptake of uh, third shots was slow. How do you expect uh, the uptake of fourth shots to go? Well, this is a very targeted program. It's targeted at those people who we know and we presented the data at, are most at risk of having waning immunity. Most of them have had uh, their third, uh, their their booster, their first booster, so their third shot, um, and their the level of protection is waning over time. So I expect 
that we are going to see a high uptake of the fourth dose in seniors and elders. I will also say that when we look at our serial prevalence that I presented, and it shows a high rate of exposure to the virus in or developing of antibodies in younger people, but a very low rate in older people. So people over age 70 and over age 80, only about 10 or 11 percent of them, somewhere around there, had antibodies to the virus, which means their protection is from vaccination and that they've, we've been, done a good job of protecting them from infection. So that, that's the group of people where um, we, we need to get that extra booster dose in to bump up their antibodies, bump up that cell-mediated immunity uh, as we're going through this next few months. And, just, uh, and, it's quite high. and just say that we're t talking about people 70 and above, so put this in context. Between 94 and 95 percent of people 70 and above have received their first dose. 92 percent have received their second dose, meaning uh, approximately 97 percent of those who got their first dose who got their second dose. Uh, with respect to those who've had two doses, 90 percent of those uh, 70 and above have received their booster dose, which is impressive. And we're expecting, because of its value, which is demonstrated by the data, and demonstrated and understood by those over 70 based on their uptake of the extraordinary uptake of vaccination in those categories. They understand better than anybody, I believe, the value of vaccination, the protection it provides to them. So I don't agree with that characterization of, uh, of it. In fact, um, uh, there's been excellent uptake amongst those over 70 and it will be our expectation as invitations go out over the next period for people when they reach um, uh, when the interval period passes from the last booster dose, I'm expecting a high, uh, high degree of uptake. And of course, there is a very high degree of uptake as well in long-term care, which we expect to see again uh, in the month of April as we go through um, both the, uh, the vaccination process and what precedes that and what's going on now, which is the, uh, in some cases the requirement for permission from others. So. Uh, I think that um, I think it's actually been quite positive, and we're uh, I'm optimistic about it. There are some areas of our vaccination program where we continue to make efforts to see um, a higher level of, of uh, vaccination. That includes uh, children uh, uh, five to eleven, for example. But um, I, I think, in general, uh, what I'd say to everybody is there are hundreds, hundreds of community pharmacies who have appointments open in BC for booster dose vaccination. And I encourage all of those who haven't got their booster, and that's over the whole province, about 1,198,000 of those who are eligible to get their booster as soon as possible. Our next question comes from Bender Sachin, CTV. Hello there. Um, I'm just wondering if you can just uh, maybe provide a number in terms of uh, community immunity and how many people you think uh, have had the virus and also, uh, I know you're talking about spring boosters for people who are older, clinically extremely vulnerable, and other groups, but I'm wondering, um, do you anticipate that the second boosters will be offered to the rest of the populations as it was, uh, as the initial vaccines were? The, the short answer is no. At this point, we don't see it progressing beyond those most at risk uh, right now. So it's the spring booster for those who need it right now, and that's uh, seniors and elders, and the data really supports that. Um, the NASI statement is, uh, is very similar. The rest of us who have had our booster already um, have good, strong protection from that still. So I don't foresee that in the near future. We don't yet know what's going to happen uh, when we come up to uh, late summer, early fall, uh, when we uh, expect to be back in respiratory season. And we're looking at the different scenarios that could happen. So it could be that we'll need uh, maybe an annual booster. Maybe it will just be for people who are most at risk. Um, so those are things that we don't yet know um, that we're planning for the different scenarios that could happen in the fall. But in the short term, the spring boost is for those who need it most, and that's seniors and elders over the age of 70 and uh, people who, who don't mount a strong immune response because of their, um, their clinical conditions. Um, in terms of what level of 
protection we have from the combination of vaccination and infection. So when I talked about the percentage of people in the seroprevalence, uh, there was a, a percentage of people that had indication of either or. And it, it differs by age. So across the board, there's probably about 50% of people who have uh, antibodies to the virus, which shows the nucleocapsid protein, which shows that they had exposure and infection. But the vast majority of those people are vaccinated. So it is a boost to their vaccine um, protection that they have already, which is a good thing. It means that most people didn't have very severe illness and they have a bit of a boost to their immunity because they were exposed and, and infected with the virus. I know um, some people still had uh, got very sick with it, um, but they didn't end up in hospital, didn't end up in critical care. And that's because they had the protection from the vaccines, whether it was two doses or, more importantly, three doses. So that needs to continue. We, we have seen, though, that in the zero to four age group, that group of young people, young children who are not yet eligible for vaccination, we're seeing that uh, about 50 to 60 percent of that age group of people have antibodies to the nucleocapsid, which means they've been exposed to uh, the virus in the recent uh, few months. And if we look at data from other places around the world, uh, we also see that Omicron does cause less severe illness in children, even than the previous variants. So this is, is a, a bit of a relief, considering we don't yet have vaccination for that age group, that Omicron is not causing severe illness for the most part in younger children. And that's um, important for us to know. I do think it is important as well to, to recognize that um, prevention of infection is important. People who get infected with this virus uh, can develop long symptoms even if they don't have very severe illness. And long COVID is a very real phenomenon that affects people. Uh, we know that, that this virus can affect, uh, it can cause um, inflammation of the, the heart, inflammation of the lining of the heart, of the blood vessels that can lead to things like strokes and, and heart attacks. Um, that go on for a long time and can leave people with long-lasting effects. Thankfully, Omicron doesn't cause that as much as, as Delta in particular, but we don't know what's coming next. What we do know is that vaccines reduce that risk of long COVID dramatically. Some studies show us at least 50% reduction in risk of having long COVID um, if you're vaccinated with two doses of vaccine. So this is my plea to people now. Recognize that we're in a place right now where we have a level of immunity. We have decreasing um, transmission in our communities. But you need to protect yourself from the risks of this virus. And it will change. We've seen that globally, that this virus will change. And so this is our best way of protecting ourselves for now and for the future. And I just also want to say, because I was going to mention and I forgot, that uh, Novavax, which is the protein subunit vaccine, a more traditional uh, form of vaccine, has finally arrived in Canada. It's been delayed for a few weeks, um, and we expect it will be available for people um, either late this week or early next week. I know there's several thousand people who've uh, signed up for it already, and you'll be getting inv invites to go to your local pharmacy to get this as soon as we get it in place. Um, and if anybody is interested right now in getting it, either as your first dose, your second dose, or a booster dose, you can call the 833-838-2323 number um, and, uh, and put yourself on the list to get that vaccine when it comes in. Binder, do you have a follow-up? I do. I'm just wondering, um, when it comes to rapid tests, uh, which most people have access to, um, how good are they at catching like subsequent variants, um, such as BA2, hearing anecdotally people saying that it takes a couple of days after infection or after becoming symptomatic to show up, in some cases not showing up at all. So just uh, is there a concern that as we see different variants that these rapid tests may not catch uh, the virus? Uh, that, that was a concern. It continues to be a concern. Um, and this is why they are most useful when you have symptoms. And yes, uh, for some people, they may not shed as much virus or they may not um, use it. I know we've all 
probably experimented with them now. They may not have uh, done a, a good enough sample to pick up the virus. Um, but we're not seeing a difference between, uh, from what I've been watching, from what our lab tells us, not seeing a difference between BA1 and, and BA2 in terms of being able to pick it up. It does sometimes test, uh, there's false positives, but there also is false negatives, especially early on in infection. So um, if you still have symptoms, repeat the test. Um, but it is also not very helpful and is less accurate if you don't have symptoms. So if you've been exposed to somebody and you don't have symptoms yourself, the rapid test doesn't really tell you anything. So again, it goes back to what I talk about, you know, it's a red light, not a green light. For the next question, we go to Lisa Cordasco, Vancouver Sun. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Henry, I just wanted to ask about the changes in death reporting. Um, it, when you know subsequently how many people have died from COVID-19, because you said at first there would be an over-reporting uh, of that number, will that number of the people who have actually died from COVID-19 be listed as a separate number or in a separate category on the dashboard? And if not, then how will we know how many people have actually died from COVID-19? Yeah, a very good question. And what I can do is, is um, get our um, uh, the the epidemiologists from uh, the VCCDC to walk through it with anybody who's interested about how we're going to uh, how the data is linked and how it is updated in real time. So there will be a retrospective decreasing and increasing of numbers as the data is refreshed over time, but it will be automated. So right now when we do that, um, you you may recall some days we we've taken off X number of cases and it, because we we do periodic data reviews. Now it will be an ongoing automated data review. Um, so at the beginning, it will look uh, more awkward than as time goes on, it will it'll even out. But I can, uh, I can reach out to our team and, and give people a technical briefing on what exactly it's going to look like, if you like. Do you have a follow-up, Lisa? Yes, thank you. Um, also on the weekly reporting, uh, it will be a weekly reporting of hospitalizations and whatnot, but if there is a spike, let's say one day there's one hospital case and the next day there's 100 and the third day there's 500, how, how will you know that before a week goes by, since that is a long time, if there is a spike, or will you be receiving those numbers daily but just be posting them weekly? Yeah, so what we do, we look at those numbers every day and they're preliminary numbers and we get these automatic preliminary numbers um, and uh, the minister and the team looks at the overall numbers. We, we pre talk about those sometimes, you know, what's the overall census in uh, ICU, how many people are there in hospital overall, um, in which beds. So this is a more, as we went to... Um, as we went to the census reporting of hospitalizations, we get the preliminary numbers every day and we will continue to do that. We'll continue to monitor that. We get preliminary reports from the lab linkage about how many people have tested positive, but there's often duplications in those. And so the numbers that come out one day um, will be uh, overestimates because they were, the cutoff was at nine o'clock instead of 10 o'clock or there was a second run or things, a whole bunch of things happen on a day-to-day -day basis that we can then then uh, once a week look back and get the more accurate numbers by day. So that's how it will be reporting coming along, but we continue to monitor these things on a day-to-day -day basis. Just, uh, one second, this is time. Just uh, there, the last, uh, there will be a daily report today and tomorrow as we go into the new weekly thing, so you'll get some information on or around 3 o'clock or between 3 and 4 o'clock today and tomorrow, and then after that we'll be moving to weekly reporting. Our next question goes to Rob Shaw, Czech News. Oh, hi. Um, I've listened to you talk about slide 12 twice in the technical briefing and, and publicly, and I, I just, I apologize if this is an overly simplistic question, but when you look at it, it looks like there's another wave of new daily hospital admissions and that in the 20% increase scenario, you get to the kind of almost height of new daily hospital admissions that we were at um, in, you know, mid January where we were worried about the stress on the healthcare system. Is that, am I reading that wrong or is that the 
is that there potential that that happens? And what what am I getting wrong about this chart? Because I don't, I feel like I must have missed something here. So again, it's modeling. So it gives us a sense of what could happen depending on different scenarios. And so some of the things that this helps us say is giving this fourth uh, spring booster dose to those who are more likely to be hospitalized can affect that. The measures that we all take to uh, check ourselves, make sure that uh, we're feeling well, testing if we have symptoms, staying away from others so that we're not transmitting it, that makes a difference in this wave. So yes, it, we expect to see a gradual increase and then a slowing, but even if we I talk through these things with the modelers all the time. At the peak, with that 20% potential increase, we would expect to see about half the hospitalizations at a very slow rate over time. So what we, um, what we saw with the Omicron was a very rapid rise and then a gradual falling off. What this is predicting is that if we do the things that we're doing, if nothing changes, then we're going to see a gradual, uh, a much slower and lower rise over time over the next couple of months, and that there are things that we can do that can affect this trajectory. Rob, do you have a follow up? No, nope, that's good. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to Moira White in the TAI. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, Dr. Henry, earlier in this briefing, you said um, that we were still seeing quite a low rate of death. Um, in the last three months, BC has seen nearly 600 people die. Uh, about a fifth of our recorded toll so far. Um, and as your modeling suggests, we're now on the precipice of a sixth wave, uh, depending on how things go. What's the reasoning behind lifting protective measures now? And how would you explain that strategy to people who are vulnerable or elderly and know that they are at the greatest risk of uh, being hospitalized or dying? Yeah, I think what we need to do is uh, put it in a balance, and we've talked about this a lot. Um, you know, there are things that we can do to protect ourselves as individuals, and there's things that we can do that protect ourselves collectively. And the number one most important one is being vaccinated, and that is it protects you as an individual. There's a fourth dose available for those who are most at risk, and we know that that makes a difference. So that's a, an important protection. But we also need to, to um, be true to the third goal of our pandemic response, which is minimizing societal disruption and understanding that there are negative consequences to each of the orders, each of the actions that we put in place by legal requirement. So we need to find those balance, and you're right, there is no magic time when there will be zero risk. So we could uh, keep in place certain things for the next two weeks and the next month. There still will be no zero risk when we remove those. So we have to find a time where we know we have strong levels of immunity in our community right now. We know that people uh, know what to do, that these become part of our healthy habits that we do to protect ourselves and our family and those we're close to, particularly um, those who are more vulnerable to severe illness. We have that extra booster shot, keeping up to date with our vaccines. Those are the things that will get us through this transition period. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging to know when is the best time to do things. But I think we're in a place as well where we're moving into summer, we're doing more things outside, there's more opportunities for people to have those safe interactions. Moira, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. Um, Dr. Henry, just further to your note on needing to find that balance, um, you know, a lot of people I've spoken to uh, who are at, at higher risk, despite being, you know, triple or even quadruple vaccinated, shortly are just saying they feel like they're at the end of what they can accomplish as an individual, and they're worried about going to the grocery store and protecting themselves uh, from their children, going to school, not wearing masks with other kids who are, you know, in large part not vaccinated either. Um, how how do you articulate the balance between someone losing their life, as we're seeing multiple people each day on average are doing in BC, uh, and, you know, having to wear a mask when you go into the grocery store? Like, what is the calculation around around that balance for you? 
Yeah. So I, I think we, I wrote an op-ed that has some of this in it as well. I think we also have been through a very traumatic period of, of two years now where this virus has changed, we've adapted. There are very few people that are at that very high level of risk anymore, and that's because we've had this highly effective vaccines. And we know that there are other risks in our community that we all need to, to pay attention to. And the measures that we're taking are ones that protect us from other respiratory illnesses, from other infections as well. And these are things that we've always done. We've always had to balance those risks about what we're seeing, what we're exposed to, what our own risk is. And right now, with the level of transmission we're seeing, with the measures that we have in place, uh, grocery stores are not a high-risk environment. And we can have the confidence that we're vaccinated, um, that we're wearing masks, we keep our respectful distance from people, we still have barriers in place, we're paying attention to things like ventilation, that we can safely do more. But it will be a transition period for all of us, and we'll have to manage that. We'll have to support each other and be positive in how we do that over the next few weeks and months. Just, uh, um, I just want to note on the issue of those most vulnerable. But I think one of the things that uh, that public health in BC, all of our medical health teams, and Dr. Henry, have put at the forefront. In everything that we have done has been to protect those who are most vulnerable to COVID-19. It's why we uh, put forward for vaccination our repeated clinically vulnerable programs that were, by the way, wildly successful in responding to the needs of those who are clinically vulnerable to get vaccinated first. Why we gave priority in terms of vaccination at every stage, including at the booster dose stage to those populations and to older people. Why, in a very significant announcement today, um, we're providing uh, a second booster uh, to those most vulnerable and clinically vulnerable to COVID-19, or a fourth dose to the clinically vulnerable community in BC. And that has been uh, affected our, our approach to other groups that have been led by Dr. Henry, including Indigenous groups in BC, and the work that has been done by the First Nations Health Authority, by Dr. Ben Smith and Dr. Henry's office is a demonstration of that. And with respect to access to antivirals, those clinically vulnerable having priority, and with respect to access to rapid tests. So at every step in this process, priority has been given to those who are clinically invulnerable. And that rep represents not just the medical approach that public health has taken in BC, but the ethical one, and it's one that I'm very proud of them for. We have time for one more question today. We'll go to Bell Puri, CBC. Absolutely. Thank you, Ian. Oh, just a, a reminder as well of, about the fact that we do have treatments available and we are getting more of them in, particularly Paxlovid, which is an antiviral, and people are prioritized by, by their own risk. And I encourage people to go to uh, the COVID treatments uh, website and get more information. There's a process there, even if you don't have access to a family physician, where you can uh, look at your own risk and whether you're eligible uh, to receive these treatments. Um, so that's another tool that we have that can support people and prevent them from having severe illness. And we've had several thousand people already who've had either Citrovimab or, or um, Paxlovid in the last few months. Sorry about that, Belle. Sorry. Thank you so much. Please go ahead with your question. No problem. Thanks. Um, Dr. Henry, if the strategy now is, you know, from British Columbians to assess their own risk for COVID and then make their own decisions based on that, you know, how do they assess that risk um, accurately if they only have weekly numbers? Like, you know, when we plan our lives, we check the weather every day, not once a week. So how do we get enough information with only weekly uh, numbers and, and not daily and in English and French, please. Yeah, so I think that weather is a very good analogy. Um, the weather does change every day. What we're seeing in terms of risk doesn't change every day. It's more like climate as opposed to weather, what you're seeing every day. And so, yeah, it is important to understand where we are collectively over time. 
but these are not measures that, uh, for example, wastewater testing, we only do it once a week. It's only able to be done at that frequency. It doesn't change that much over a period of a day or 24 hours. And so, yes, um, it is, uh, we need to think of it in a period of a longer period of time. What's my risk this week? What are the things that I feel comfortable doing, um, you know, next week? Uh, well, shall I go out to a restaurant with friends this coming weekend? Here's how I'm feeling. Here's what I know about my friends and whether they've been uh, exposed to anybody with COVID. Uh, here's how, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to look at how am I feeling today? Do I have a scratchy throat? Do I have a fever? Maybe I'll, I'll hold off meeting with um, going to visit my grandparents if I'm not feeling so well today. Those are the things that we need to start building into how we do our assessment and having a daily number of people who are in, uh, test positive for COVID is not going to help us make those decisions in a in a in a one on one basis on a day to day basis because it doesn't change that much from day to day. We can get a sense of what's happening in our communities in the province over time, and uh, a weekly time frame is what is most reasonable given what we're seeing with transmission patterns right now. Oui, effectivement, le temps change uh, quotidiennement, mais uh, les risques de COVID-19 ne changent pas de cette façon-là. Donc, des, uh, des updates hebdomadaires uh, marchent bien pour des gens. Uh, mais si c'est lundi, uh, il faut être vacciné. Si c'est mardi, il faut être vacciné. Si c'est vendredi, il faut être vacciné, etc. Donc, ça ne change pas. On va avoir beaucoup d'informations. De, de, uh, pour des gens uh, uh, chaque, uh, chaque jeudi, ce qui va être important pour les gens qui s'intéressent, et c'est important pour cela. Mais um, uh, ce virus ne change pas uh, d'un jour à l'autre. Les risques ne changent pas d'un jour à l'autre. Donc, je pense, uh, je pense que c'est important d'avoir uh, les renseignements uh, là-dessus. Et on va, on va en avoir beaucoup pour des gens. Et si les choses changent uh, directement et vite, on va uh, bien entendu revenir ici et vous informer. Mais je pense que uh, ce n'est pas comme le temps en, en ce sens. En ce sens, c'est. Uh, et je pense qu'il y aura beaucoup de renseignements pour des gens de prendre des bonnes décisions sur COVID-19. Bell, do you have a follow-up? Yes, please, Dr. Henry. The transition phase, we've heard it many times before. So, you know, how confident are you that this reprieve from restrictions um, would be permanent this time around? Because we hear you say, not through it yet. Um, how long until we are through it? Sounds a little yeah. ominous. So in Eng English and French, please. Uh, you know, I, I, I wish I knew. Um, you know, I think about it, we talk about it becoming endemic, and endemic means there's going to be a certain level of circulation of the virus, but it doesn't mean good, and it doesn't mean that it's only mild and we don't have to worry about it. COVID is going to be one, I believe, one of the viruses that we're going to have to manage along with influenza, along with RSV, along with parainfluenza um, on a periodic basis for the foreseeable future. Um, in a best case scenario, if we were all optimists, um, it would fade into be more like an adenovirus or a common cold virus. But it's not there right now. Um, so for the next few months, we have a sense of where we are. We have a high level of immunity. We have lots of antibodies. Uh, we're giving a, a boost to immunity to those who need it most. But I'm also planning for what are the possible scenarios come uh, come the fall, and what surveillance measures do we need to have in place to tell if we're going down a more severe brand new virus versus uh, less severe um, good immunity continuing from the vaccines that we have. So those are the thought processes that we're going through right now. Um, I hope we don't have to ever go back to orders because that legal um, enforceable order is a last resort in a public health framework. 
Um, and it's when we absolutely need to do that. We know a lot more about how we behave and how that can protect us and, and keep us from getting sick. And you know, for people who've n not had a cold or, or uh, influenza for the last two years, we, we've seen that. So we have to take those all into account. Um, we're not at the point where uh, we understand the, the periodicity and the changing of this virus, so there's still a lot of uncertainty. I think for another year, we'll be in a better place to understand that in a year. But in the meantime, we are in a good place to take the measures that we, uh, to, to, to remove some of the restrictions that we have in place right now because of the level of immunity that we have. So I can't predict if it's going to be better or worse. And we've been talking about this globally as well as uh, you know across the country and here in BC. And uh, we can look at models. We can look at the potential. I think the worst case scenario uh, would be if a whole new variant arose that was a coronavirus that uh, the vaccine protection didn't. Uh, that was able to evade vaccine protection and was causing more severe illness than Delta, for example. Then we would have to look at taking some of these more drastic measures that keep people apart and slow down that transmission until we had a new vaccine or, or an effective treatment. But that's like a whole new pandemic starting. So that's one of the scenarios that we need to think through. Um, I expect probably will be somewhere in the middle and that we'll need a booster dose at some point in time for most people, perhaps sooner for those who are more vulnerable. Um, but there's, as I say, I, I don't want to be ominous. We're in a good place now. We need to take advantage of that and we need to learn about uh, how to live with COVID better and um, make sure that we're taking those precautions that we know work for us personally and, of course, to get vaccinated. Oui, euh, et juste en français, je pense que c'est un virus, le COVID-19, qui a des surprises, sur, qui va avoir des surprises encore pour nous. Donc, euh, il va falloir euh, s'y préparer, n'est-ce pas? Et on, on est en train de le faire. On est en train, par exemple, de préparer de, de, tout, de, tous les scénarios euh, pour l'automne et pour l'hiver, parce qu'on sait que ça, c'est euh, la saison des. Euh, des virus respiratoires et il faut être préparé. On va continuer à faire nos efforts à fond parce que dans le système de santé actuellement, il y a beaucoup de défis. Il y a des défis pour la santé primaire, il y a des défis pour les chirurgies, il y a des défis dans nos hôpitaux et il y a une, un, un groupe de travailleurs dans le système de, de, de santé qui sont épuisés par l'expérience de COVID-19 et tout ce qui s'est passé depuis deux ans, il y a beaucoup à faire donc et nous allons continuer à préparer à fond tous les scénarios de COVID-19, mais pour d'autres choses aussi et de continuer à faire ce travail avec vous tous. Et je pense pour la population en général, pour des gens en général, Il va euh, falloir continuer à vivre avec le COVID-19. Il c'est toujours une pandémie. Il faut toujours le gérer au niveau so de société. Mais euh, il y a aussi, et ça va, euh, ça va être avec nous pour des mois, et sans doute euh, plus que ça, des ans à venir. Et donc, euh, il va... Uh, c'est nécessaire de prendre l'avantage de ces circonstances actuellement, mais de répondre à ce qui nous donne le, le virus dans les mois à venir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you soon.